like to introduce our next guest this evening, Ken Paul Rosenthal. Ken produces films that exist as works of art, but also function as tools for personal and societal transformation, work that is both critical and creative at once, which he likes to call sensual intelligence. Ken holds a master in creative and interdisciplinary arts, as well as an MFA in cinema production. Welcome, Ken. Thanks for having me, Audrey. I'm so glad that you wanted to be on the show and talk about uh, your new mental health trilogy. And um, could you talk about how you were inspired to make this mental health trilogy? Well, it all started with the first film in the trilogy, which is called Crooked Beauty. And uh, I was in my apartment about eight, seven, eight years ago and just happened upon a magazine that was co-edited by the hero of that film, Crooked Beauty. And I picked up the magazine and I read the way she was speaking about her own experience with her own mental distress. And something with it resonated so deeply that I was inspired to make this film in a what I call a thunderclap of inspiration. It was that consummate, that deeply, uh, that deep the inspiration was for me. So uh, I immediately contacted her and two days later we met and I pitched making the film and she said yes. And that her name? Jax Ashley McNamara. Okay, wow. So it just really came to you, I guess. Like you said, it was a thunderbolt that came to you as in seeing her work or her, her organization that she was involved in. Is that the Icarus Project? Yes, it's the Icarus Project. And the Icarus Project is an online and grassroots um, support network. Uh, it's peer-led, so it's by and for people with experiences that our culture deems mental illnesses, but which uh, the radical mental health movement considers uh, dangerous gifts. And by dangerous gifts, they're not trying to romanticize mental distress, but to say, well, what uh, can uh, we have access to in the darker parts of ourselves? Like there's a great quote by Carl Jung, and he says, if you get rid of the pain before you answer its questions, you're getting rid of a part of yourself along with it. So that's really, really profound. Wow. The idea that there's something to be learned by how skillfully we can navigate the parts of ourselves that our society would tuck away, you know, put under the counter or medicate over the counter, be as it may. Yeah, that's a fantastic um, project, the Icarus Project, um, and a great lead up to, let's look at the roll in from your film, Crooked Beauty. There's this fundamental impulse either towards suppressing our traumas by medicating the symptoms of them away or facing down our traumas, quote unquote, by delving straight into the teeth of whatever our childhood beasts are. There's not a lot of focus on what is in the middle. What does it mean to acknowledge the way that the past has been a formative thing in our lives without reliving the past over and over? Mental illness does not exist in a vacuum saying that it is nothing but a biological brain disorder lets everybody off the hook and makes it this situation where it's just the individual versus his or her inevitable biological madness. I think that a lot of people who get labeled as mentally ill in our society have really broken hearts. A lot of the behaviors and the attitudes that I had before I got locked up in a psych ward and given a diagnosis had a lot more to do with trying to escape from my sadness than I think they necessarily had to do with a mental illness. If I was determined to live my life in a city and to work a really intensive, steady job, in an office, I think I would have to take medication to do that. But I don't think that fact means that I have a disease. It means that it would take a pharmaceutical substance to override my instincts, to make me capable of fitting into a system that was not designed for someone with a spirit like mine. I'm just really sensitive and my moods shift in ways that I don't really keep a rhythm that fits with the clock of capitalist society. 
I'm learning more to listen to my own rhythms, particularly as they pertain to things like seasons and light. And it's unreasonable to think that you should be able to be performing the same every day in a world that's constantly changing. This is a, a profound film and it, it's, it's so moving and it's interesting to see the impact that, that it's had on the psychiatric community or the mental health community. How, can you talk about where this film has been shown and how it's impacted that group? Yeah, well, I think I put, should, should say first that it's not just people who identify as living with mental distress because I think, like Jake, Krishnamurti said, you know, it's no measure of wellness to be adjusted to a profoundly sick society. So madness is not just a biochemical knot from the neck up. It's a reflection of a social condition. So all of us, you know, it's a very prescient issue, mental distress. Uh, we live in really chaotic times. So I think that's why the film has been so well received by a really broad audience, because we all either know someone, have experienced something ourselves, or just living in this world by, by proxy, you know, feel like we're going to go mad or consider becoming a bridge statistic in some way, even if it's only as a fleeting fantasy. So I've shown it certainly to people who identify as consumers of, of mental health services in peer recovery support networks, but I've also shown it at uh, mental health symposia. I've been in psych wards. I've been in a lot of psychology departments and universities. Uh, art students really, really are inspired by this film because there is a kind of crazy making, you know, when you're making art, you're not just making uh, something that has an aesthetic form or value or weight, but you're also making yourself or unmaking yourself. Things are emerging. So. And <clears throat> in a way, it's like you're, you're an artist and an activist with these films. Yeah. And there's also, this is the first film in a trilogy. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a bit about the other films? Well, uh, all the films, the synergy between all three of them, I think, is stronger than any one film could be by themselves. The second film is uh, more autobiographical. It's called Four Shadows. And the third film is called In Light In. And that one uh, is uh, sort of a, a darkly humorous visual essay on the disease model of mental distress. The one that's more autobiographical deals with my relationship to my shadow and coming to terms with it. But to um, address what you asked about activism, I think it's really, really important as an artist to, at some point in their career, uh, to get out of the studio of their minds and really think about um, the artist as um, giving people uh, the common citizen language for experiences that they otherwise don't have the words for. I think all art, even its some simplest, most humble form, is, is somehow giving expression to some feeling or some sensation. But if you can harness that, then you can really promote change. And I really believe strongly in um, reaching the head through the heart. I believe very, very passionately about the power of beauty to open people up and then make them more receptive to the message. I remember reading or hearing at some point that early in, uh, in, 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 fa uh, in the roots of fascism in Germany, Hitler went after the artists first because he understood how much power they have. And I think uh, that potential has been lost and is now being reclaimed by way of documentary film. Uh, documentary film, we're kind of in a golden age of documentary. And what's nice is like experimental film is not just sort of an outsider practice anymore. And I think in Crooked Beauty and all these um, uh, films in the trilogy are merging my m more poetic aesthetics with being very, very conscious um, politically of how I can merge the two together in order to affect um, change out in the world. If I just stood on a soapbox and pontificated, you know, you'd just be ranting and, and people wouldn't listen. But if you can um, uh, have your message come across in the context of something that's beautiful and artful, then they'll be more receptive, uh, receptive to it. And you were, you were explaining to me uh, the process that you arrived at while you were, you know, you had done these interviews with Jack and you, you were maybe going to do, you know, the talking head shots. Mm. And you were trying to, can you talk about what you, how you arrived at this experimental piece? Well, it, it, um, it was really, really critical for me that uh, given how, again, prescient um, uh, mental distress is in, these, in this chaotic world, 
that I make a film that was fresh and authentic. And I didn't want to perpetuate the status quo of someone sitting in a chair, having the camera pointed at them, and talking to someone off camera. It felt like you were sort of putting them in a little psych ward, in a cage, you know, the cage of the frame. I really wanted to open up the field of view and make something very, very cinematic. And um, so as my working principle, I used metaphors as a way of embodying the speaking subject. So it wasn't just Jax's story, but her story became a touchstone for all of our stories and what we, again, observe in the world and you know, those that we're in relationship to around us. And how are you approaching the second and third film? So the second film, the one that's autobiographical, is Four Shadows. And for that film, what I've done is uh, taken the home movies that my father shot of the first five years of my life. And what I'm doing f is uh, taking voiceovers from mental hygiene films from the 1940s and 1950s, you know, those voice of God narrations. And we hear those over these very um, tender, innocent images of, of, you know, early childhood. And then there's another layer of narrative, which is a text at the bottom of the screen or at other points, you know, right in the center of the screen, which is the voice of the protagonist. So you have what is seen, what is heard, and what is read all sort of conspiring to articulate some sense of what it's like to uh, be conditioned and uh, to, to not be authentic. Because I think uh, for me and a lot of people, a lot of madness comes out of not being allowed to fully unfold to the promise we come into this world with. So what better place to dive into that and, and uh, you know, uncover these, these, uh, these buried narratives than, than the home movies and these old educational mental hygiene films. And then the third film, is uh, instead of just taking the voiceover from these old mental hygiene films, taking the actual images. So a lot of these father knows best images, you know, the father coming home from a long day at work, having an ulcer, kicking the cat, tripping over the kids' toys, and yelling at the wife. And, and these films are really fascinating because, you know, films say a lot more about the time in which they were made than what the films are about themselves. So you can actually reauthor your own narrative by repurposing these old films and recontextualizing them in the present. And that's what I've done with the trilogy. And I think we have uh, some slides from the films. Um, if we can take a look at the, a couple of the slides. Yes, yeah, so this is from Four Shadows. That's a picture of me. Um, I'm sure you can see the resemblance to my fingers. <laughs> and uh, so here's an example of how, um, you know, that's my mother's hand, that's my, my face, and uh, how you know, the text of the protagonist is being put there to give voice to him, too. And then the, these are... And this is from In Light In. Uh, this is sort of like, you know, that children's um, book, Where's Waldo? And so sort of wanted a Where's Waldo approach to that prior frame. Um, uh, but <laughs> we're going kind of quickly here. But these are just examples. These last two slides were, are taken from these old mental hygiene films. And uh, it's just really, really fascinating to me, again, to sort of explore the way we're encultured to behave in a certain way. And they call them mental hygiene, like let's sanitize our mentality. And, you know, meaning is born out of difference. We all are so different. But is there anything more crazy-making than sort of the, uh, the, the gentrifying or the, um, the, the homogenizing of, of everything that we are uh, what, or can be? There's, there's a great... Uh, saying, um, those who do not write are written upon. I mean, culture will inscribe its meanings in you if you don't sort of pick up this pen of possibility and write your own script. Well, Ken, thank you for coming. That was an amazing journey, and I look forward to seeing the films at the... Exploratorium on October 9th at 7 o'clock. Thank you so much for coming. You're welcome. Thank you.